Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is three reasons out to outsource fulfillment with my friend Nathan Lugo Montanez. I met Nathan at Manifest, and he works for a company called Stasi, S-T-A-C-I. And it is a big European company that just made a big splash here in the United States when they bought Amware. The new company has 81 locations worldwide. It's a quite the juggernaut. And in the podcast, I spoke to Nathan about three reasons to outsource fulfillment. Actually, I think we actually had four or five, but he's a very knowledgeable guy. He's been around, he's done a lot of great things, and he's a very interesting guest. And please take a listen. But before we get to the interview, I want to tell you how to save 40% on your small parcel shipping. You call Tusk Logistics. Tusk Logistics is a technology company that is connected all of these regional small parcel carriers, and you can save 40%. So if you're a warehousing company, does a lot of small parcel shipping, if you're an e-commerce company doing a lot of small parcel shipping, you can save 40%. These small parcel carriers, the regional ones, the smaller ones, they're not UPS, they're not FedEx, they're not the Postal Service, but they have better service than those companies oftentimes, and they can save you 40%. Tusk has got pre-negotiated rates with a lot of these top companies, and then put them all together in a really easy to use software, very powerful software. 40% savings, better service. And on top of that, you have the Tusk team that does the day-to-day customer service. So there's no reason at all why you wouldn't move. You're going to get better service, better pricing, 40% savings. Absolutely can't lose. So talk to my friends over at Tusk Logistics. That's T-U-S-K. TuskLogistics.com, and there's a button there at the top that says Get Started, and you should do that. So how's it going, Nathan? Hey, Joe. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Really excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much. Nathan, did I botch your name? Is it Lugo Montanez? No, no, that's perfect. I I mean, I I botched my own name plenty of times. You did it perfectly. (laughs) So I asked you before we hit record, why do you have two last names? Explain, please. (laughs) So I'm of uh, Spaniard descent. So in Spain, it's typical to carry the paternal and maternal name. Uh, ah, very nice. And and you also told me that you speak, I asked you if you spoke Spanish, and then you said... I do. So I speak a couple languages. I speak uh, Spanish, Italian, French, Portuguese, and Arabic. I also speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't said my joke about it lately, but if you speak two languages, you're bilingual. If you speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you speak one language, you're an American. <laughs> it's not as well, true. I'm proud to be an American that speaks multiple languages. <laughs> anyway, Nathan, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Sure. So uh, my name is Nathan Lugo Montanez. I'm the executive vice president of strategy and innovation for Stasi US. Our US division is headquartered here in Jersey City, New Jersey. Very nice. Very nice. Now, I met you at Manifest uh, probably a month ago right. now, and you guys are doing big things. I never heard of Stasi. And if you go on the website of Stasi, you go, oh, okay, it's a European company. Oh, they got a few locations here, but that's not the whole story. So tell us the whole story about Stasi. No. So, so I'll start at the beginning. So Stasi spelled S-T-A-C-I. Those are actually the initials, and I'm going to butcher this, the Société de Transaction Agricole Commercial et Industriale. Uh, you said it right. Society, <laughs> Society of Transactions uh, in Agriculture, Commercial, and, and Industry. And the name's quite broad because when the company was created in 1989 by Jean-Pierre Masset, his intention was to distribute wine by mail. Oh, I now, like him already. Fast forward, yeah, he was ahead of, ahead of his time before Wine.com. But fast forward, we are now, I believe, over 81 locations globally. We have locations in, we are headquartered in saint germain France, but we have locations in France, Germany, Spain, Netherlands, uh, the UK, and, and in 2019 we launched our first facility here in Jersey City, New Jersey. And since 2019, we expanded organically to the West Coast, and we have a facility in Memphis, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, through Base Logistics. And just five days ago, on, on March 1st, we acquired Amware Logistics, 
which is a wonderful warehouse and logistics company with 15 of their own locations. So now we have 18 locations throughout the U.S. in California, Nevada, Arizona, Chicago, Georgia, and New Jersey. Uh, so we have a wide footprint in the United States now, and, and we're not looking to stop there. Yeah, I'm guessing if you have how many locations worldwide? Uh, over 81 and probably about 12 plus million square feet of, of warehouse space. So you guys aren't getting smaller anytime soon. So yeah, very interesting. Yeah. This is why you got to get over to Manifest. By the way, Bob, we mentioned Manifest. What do you think? I thought it was such a great conference. It was very well put together. I really loved the breakout sessions. I took advantage of, of a lot of them. And the the exhibitors, I met, I, I met some fantastic exhibitors. I met you there, obviously. And that we're actually having conversations now based on, on what we saw. Oh, I'll be having there. conversations for months because I thought I'd, thought I'd follow up with everybody right away. But here we are a month later and you're probably one of the first yeah. people I've followed up with. But yeah, I met, uh, we were just talking before we hit record. We we're talking about Tusk Logistics. I met those fellas there, Ben Emmerich. And, and I mentioned what they're doing. So they're one of you know, advertising for them. But they, I met Ben there and I met Annie, who's... Um, one of the Zops people, and uh, they're doing small parcel. And you said you're you're investigating using them. You would you would you don't meet all these people unless you get out into these conferences. No, no, it's definitely it's definitely who you know because we were introduced to Ben and and he's doing he's really shaking things up in this industry by by consolidating all consolidating all of these carriers into challenging UPS essentially and FedEx and the small parcel delivery. So. I'm excited about what he's doing. You know, pragmatically, I want to make sure that it fits our business. And and he and I and, and my team are working together in identifying the sweet spots where we can we can at least trial it out. But as a business, I mean, he's really he's really ahead of his time. I've said this on my podcast probably five times over the years: is somebody is going to get some a, a big pot of money and they're going to buy up all these regional carriers and they're going to become a competitor to UPS and FedEx. Now, you could also say put USPS in there because they're a big player. But what Ben did is he, uh, and well, not just Ben, his Ben and his partner and his team, they put together Tusk Logistics where they've connected all these great regional carriers with technology and regional carriers will save you the big bucks. And they probably in their little like Lone Star in Texas, they're better than UPS, in fact. So nothing against the big guys, but the big guys aren't going to give you 40% savings. They don't have to. They have plenty of business without you. Tusk Logistics, that's their business. I love that. Also, I saw Chana from um, Rabat. I have, I'm have. i going to have him on my podcast again. And I, we were just talking about Rabat. So tell them what you guys are doing with Rabat. So Rabat is a machine learning AI camera system that is attached to the packing station. And Chana and Asura and Alina and Sandeep and the whole Rabat team, <clears throat> they've, they've really been, been a part of Stasi for the last year, year and a half. And, and I champion them whenever I, whatever chance I get. I don't, I don't get any kickback from them. So Chana, if you're listening, help a brother out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, the, the technology is fantastic and our customers love it. And what it does is it, it's a camera. That's the king of the, the pa- king of the packing station. You have to say that or you're not going to get paid. King of the packing station? I didn't know that. It just, it's a camera that sits overhead and is recording to the cloud the actions of the packer. And what it's doing, it's, it's learning the, the packing algorithm as it's tied into the WMS and it knows the cubic dimensions of the boxes. And the intent is that it, it will tell you if a package is packed properly and completely before you so send it out. Have all of the, before you even close the box. And right now they're working on real time alerts that go to the shift supervisor, shift manager, or team leader. They have a really great dashboard that tells you the metrics of productivity at, at, at a site or at a packing station. So, you know, I, I met Shauna through LinkedIn, ironically enough. Yeah, I think I did too. About a year and a half, two years ago. But his whole team, they're just mad scientists and, and brilliant individuals. And you know, we have weekly calls with them on some of the products that they're doing because we, we're also allowing them to, to kind of beta test on a couple of our stations. 
So that way they can test these new ideas and we're acting as an incubator, if you will, for, for a lot of their things, which has produced some great stuff. Yeah, we've gotten in the mode um, uh, in the, with e-commerce of, first off, we act as a fitting room, right? So I, if you were going to order some sweaters, you'd order it three, three uh, different colors, try them all on and send two back, right? And it's all free. And in addition, if somebody was to send those three sweaters and you said, oh, I only got two. We have to we have to deal with that, and we don't always have the information. Also, I want to know before the guy puts the tape on the box that everything that's supposed to be in the box is in the box, and that's what our buddies at Chana and Asura and company Rabat. I'll put a link to I'll put a link to the interview I did with Chana uh, a few years ago. He before they got started, or maybe after they got started, he worked at six different warehousing companies and learned what was the biggest problems. And I think it was in six locations across the country. I forgot which ones, but some in Texas, some in California, some out east. And then he took that, told him what he was there for. And you don't see that kind of effort put in by every tech company. No, his his solution, what he's building to is is real world experience, lived problems, not theoretic. Yep. Or not uh, hyperbole that, oh, I heard that this was a problem. Let's build it and they will come. He's lived it, he's seen it, and he's making solutions that are practical. Yep. I met Chana and his wife at a VC cocktail party when I was over at Manifest. So anyway, well, Ruthie, I met so many. Uh, Ruthie's, Ruthie's such a lovely person. Yep, yep. Very nice. I tell Very Ruthie's, nice. Uh, she's taking up Muay Thai. So I told Rana, uh, Chana he's got to tone down his rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway... We talked a little bit about what Stasi's doing. Tell us a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you joined Stasi. And then also, why did you join Stasi? Sure. So let me give you the Cliff Notes version. Born and raised in Chicago. And at the tender age of, of 17, not really sure what I was going to do. I, I enlisted in, in the military. So I spent it wouldn't be 10 tender years. after that. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent 10 years in... In the U.S. Army, U.S. Army Infantry, and started off as, as a soldier, team leader. I uh, was a drill sergeant for, for a couple of years. You seem too uh, mild-mannered to be a drill sergeant. <laughs> Most drill sergeants typically are, believe it or not. Well, I'm watching too much TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's not like a full metal jacket or anything. <laughs> Good. That's, all, that's, only when, that's only when you're around trainees. But uh, finished my career with with the 75th Ranger Regiment, and before oh, I was wow. I was going to leave, I had a platoon uh, platoon leader reach out to me and say, "Listen, I know you're getting out. I'm working for a company called Mikasa. Would you be interested in joining me in operating in supply chain here in New Jersey? You know, from from the Midwest." I said, "All right, I just have two questions." What supply chain and where's New Jersey? So, <laughs> other than that, it sounds good. <laughs> other than that, it sounds great. And and packed bags, and I landed in New Jersey. And from there, uh, they were headquartered in, in Caucus, New Jersey. Macasa makes those that like the art pieces, right? They they do. They're they're more of a home goods. And and unfortunately, but expensive. They, they, up, <laughs> they were they were expensive, but now they're 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 owned by a conglomerate. So they're they're being operated as such, but uh, we ended up opening up greenfields throughout the U.S. and and working with three PLs. And I was there for several years, running their their distribution centers, their in-house distribution centers, and three PLs. And then I was approached by a couple of we worked with a couple of uh, McKinsey and BCG consultants, and they were launching their own boutique firm in New York. And they said, hey, we're going to launch this firm. We'd like you to, to join us. We don't know if it's going to work. We don't know if we're going to be able to pay you. And you're probably going to work a lot of hours. So how do you say no to something like that? <laughs> exactly. But they, they're, they're incredibly brilliant individuals. You were with the Rangers. I'm pretty sure I'm just going to pay you no matter what. <laughs> you're the first paycheck I'm writing every week. <laughs> no, they, they had a really sound business idea for providing fractional executives 
for transformational transformational operations. So whether it was it was consulting, it was uh, outside consulting or a fractional inside change agents, uh, we we worked with Amazon, we worked with uh, USPS and with American Express. Well, that was probably still in the infancy of uh, e-commerce, right? It very it very much was, it, and these guys were were supply chain innovation experts, and and they had a very deep network. So, so were you? <laughs> well, I I was blessed to to learn from people smarter than me, and I continue to learn from people smarter than me, and I'm 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 constantly trying to learn because supply chain, as you know, is changing at at breakneck speed. Just even going to manifest and seeing the new technology. Oh yeah, it, it makes your head spin. It, it does, and and it's very easy to get lost in the bright and shiny, right? So so in some respects, you have to stay, you have to get back to basics. Yeah, be grounded. But but I fell in love with with supply chain and the complexity and simplicity of it. I, I have a, a master's in business. I have a master's in public administration. Uh, I also. When uh, did you get all those? This was throughout my career, and I, I went to Michigan State MSU to, for an executive master's in supply chain management uh, and operations. Can't get much better than that. No, and I'm currently in my first year for my doctorate, Columbia International University for strategy, strategic leadership, and innovation. Wow, wow! So, when and why did you join Stasi? So I was introduced to Nicolas Maurice, who is the CEO uh, and chairman of Stasi US, about three years ago. And this is when they had just launched into the US. A former employee of mine, she was working with them, and they were having a lot of problems implementing and integrating a new client to where this client was threatening to leave. And the, the, the whole operation was going sideways. And she reached out to me and she says, you know, can you speak to our CEO? I think you'd be perfect for this. And, and I was trying to actually turn it, turn it into a project, right? Turn it into an engagement, uh, not to be an incumbent. So long story short, I had several conversations with Nicholas. I really liked what we had. We had really great conversations. And, and finally, he says, I want you to come on and, and be part of the team as an incumbent. And I was like, no way. I have no interest in being part of a 3PL. But, but when I thought about it and I saw Stasi's growth in Europe and I saw their vision for what they want to do in the U.S., I quickly changed my mind because I said, this is a, a smart, innovative company that is, it's almost like joining Facebook before Facebook was Facebook. Right. Or joining Walmart when it was just a couple of stores. And, I'm so glad that I did because obviously six days ago, we just made a huge acquisition and, and the next 12 months in integrating Amware and Stasi and, and what we're going to do in North America is exactly what just kind of energizes me and, and really fills me up. And I, I've definitely heard of Amware and I don't know if you were even able to talk about it at Manifest, but I do remember you saying you, this is a huge company with a small presence in the US. Yeah. And I'm guessing a month ago, you couldn't say anything about it, but... Right. It was tough to keep tight lipped about it. But I but my sense was look they they didn't come to the US to open three locations. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and and to be clear, you know, we're we're not interested in being the biggest. We want to be the best. And and that is the intent. And that's why we chose Amware, because there was a long period of, of seeking out other clients, but it's just Amware and Stasi share the same DNA in terms of of our commitment to our clients, and it's not hyperbole. We, Harry, Harry Druppage, who is the, who's the new CEO of, of Stasi and, and he's current CEO of, of, uh, of Amware, you can hear the enthusiasm, the passion when he speaks about his clients. Like he, he genuinely cares, as, as well as the EVP of operations. They, they love their clients, and, and that is, if, if clients are really just a means to an end or a, a responsibility, you're going to lose them quick. But they've had clients for decades and that speaks to their commitment yeah I, I always think when you talk about third-party logistics we have the transportation companies they own trucks they own buildings warehouses 
they own planes, boats, et cetera. Then you have the logistics guys who are kind of dealing the information and there's a lot of the freight brokerage, I guess, would fall under that. And then there's the tech companies. But I always look at warehousing and fulfillment is when I move my stuff into your location, <laughs> we are now, we are joined at the hip. We are married because it is not a transactional relationship. Now you can have transactional relationships with a transportation company or a logistics company, not so much with uh, warehousing and fulfillment. So I think people, and, and by the way, I'm a big believer that we should have more strategic relationships with everybody in the in the supply chain. Absolutely. But it, I think it when you talk about warehousing and fulfillment, people have to spend a little more time looking because they know my, as soon as my stuff's on their shelves, we are not easily separated and nor should you be. I mean, that's, that's no. my feeling. And, and I, and I, I express this to all our clients. If, if they fail, we fail, right? And if we fail, they're failing. So their clients, their customers are- Then if they customers. grow, you grow, right? So if they right. say, yeah, and, we and, grew 30%, that's 30% more shipments. Right. So you know, you're saying that trucks, uh, uh, trucking companies own trucks and, and mar maritime companies own ships. We own relationships. And, and it's, it's uphill, uh, upward and downward relationships, relationships with our clients and relationships with their customers, even though we may never speak to them or see them, but we're still touching them by the quality of the parcels that we send to them. Yeah. I've said this many times on my podcast, and it's just my observation uh, while I gained all these gray hairs is that regardless of the business you're in, anybody who's a customer who holds you at arm's length, at some point that relationship ends. And what I mean by that is we've all had that customer where we say, hey, can we can we have a weekly meeting or every other week? And they're like, oh, you know, I don't know. We're so busy. Uh, just send us a report. And, and then at some point, at some point they go, oh, well, you didn't do this for us. You didn't do that for us. And or there's a new guy there and he says, you guys didn't do all these things. And you're like, I was trying for years, but it just didn't happen. And it goes both ways. I mean, I, I think we need to do more of that. But I, my feeling is when you talk about relationships like you just were, you either get them and keep those customers and be able to have the honest conversations that makes things go better, or you don't. <laughs> and if you don't, you're going to lose that customer. Well, it's it's if you're not talking to your customer, somebody else is going to. And and even beyond the customer, which is important to recognize, and this is another reason why the Amware Stasi merger is a perfect fit, is our is our associates. Richard Branson said it best, uh, and I'm pretty sure it was Richard Branson that said, "If you take care of your employees, your employees will take care of your customers." Right, right, right. And I've never seen that math work any other way. Yep. It reminds me, I had a, um, I was, I heard a speaker talk about this one time. He said he was a retail guy and he said, I went to a conference and I spoke and there was, he goes, mostly executives. And he said, how many of you believe customer service, the number one thing in your business? And all of them raised their hand. Of course he raised your hand. And then he said, um, good. So we pretty broad agreement. That's, you know, one of the num number one things you need to worry about. And they're like, yep. And he says, who spent more than one hour last week with the frontline employees at your stores. <laughs> and, and he was making the point that they're the ones who deal with your customers. They're the ones delivering that customer service. And if you don't have any connection to them, uh, you could go astray. Anyway, I want to switch gears on you. So we talked before we hit record about three reasons to outsource fulfillment. And I know we, you guys have a whole bunch. I'm sure you can mention some names. You have some very impressive logos. So can you name some of the companies you're currently working with? Sure, sure. So we have um, L'Occitane. We have a lot of French companies that have, have come to the U.S. So L'Occitane, uh, Lime Life, which is, uh, what I believe, is probably one of our top five uh, clients globally. They're, they're, in, they're in Spain. They're certainly in France. And what do they the sell? UK and, and here. So they sell women's beauty products, makeup, skin care, hair care, uh, foundations. Then we have uh, Pierre Fabre, which is also a, a French company. They're a $2 billion company that sells what we call cosmeceuticals, right? So pharmaceutical yep. grade cosmetics and, and, and their clients are private citizens as well as professional the health and beauty experts and, and doctor's offices that prescribe uh, or offer their skincare regimen. Biologique Recherche, 
which is another luxury brand that we partner with and we're distributing. We also do some food and beverage, specifically Cosme Tea, which is a, a French tea company, probably one of the finest teas that you can find out there. And, and we even really like to work in the startup space with, so I, I think particularly a really fantastic brand, uh, the CEO is Helia, who started Slick Chicks that does undergarments and clothing for what started off as, as uh, disabled people. So you could put on undergarments and, and clothing while while still in, in your wheelchair or bed bound. But her product has grown incredibly well in terms of, of product depth, but also her reach. So she's in JCPenney, she's QVC, she's, I believe she's in Target now. So just to see these these startups grow in our infrastructure is really exciting. Excellent. Excellent. So you've had the conversation, three reasons to outsource fulfillment. So let's go over some of those reasons. So what's the, so if you're talking to somebody who's you know, on the fence and saying, well, we, we, we are a big company, we can do this on our own, or I've been doing this from our garage for the last six months. <laughs> we have no problem with this. What is, what's the first thing you talk about with them? You're, you're holding me down to just six and there's so many. <laughs> but th there is a point of diminishing returns. And so where if you're only selling a couple of products a month, okay, you know, you want to, you want to, but if you're at a point now where you're spending more time on distribution than you are on building your brand, you have to look at this from the first reason people consider a 3PL for their e-commerce distribution is economics, right? Because that is where by outsourcing logistics to a 3PL, you can save money on warehousing and transportation costs because 3PLs obviously have a, a, a better rates because of the volume that, that we push with your UPS, FedEx, Tusk Logistics of the world, um, as well as labor costs that are associated with managing the logistics function. But even from expanding onto the, the direct cost savings is the reduced risk because the 3PL providers assume some of the risks associated with logistics such as your inventory management and transportation, which can help companies reduce their exposure to potential losses. Right. And I'm assuming there's also, you've kind of turned a, a fixed cost into a variable one in many cases, right? Correct. So, so that, that would lead me to my second reason is scalability. With, with 3PLs, we can help companies scale their logistics operations up and down quickly to accommodate changes in demand without the need to invest in additional resources. And, and we do this because to tie it to the second reason, that's our core competency, right? If you're selling sweaters and you're selling a lot of them, it's not because you're a great distributor. Nobody cares, oh, I got this sweater really fast, but it's kind of crappy. You make fantastic sweaters. Let us help you leverage our core competency in getting it to your customers fast and, and by outsourcing this logistics, companies can focus on their core competencies and allocate those resources to, to that, you know, to that function instead of to other parts of the business, like trying to find a warehouse. Right. And, you know, it, it, you make a great point. I've said this before on my podcast, but it's, it's so true is if, if you found somebody who had the ability to drive traffic to a website and develop a product or buy a product from somebody. That means you're doing purchasing, maybe you're doing some manufacturing, you're doing a lot of digital marketing, you're great at social media. The idea that you'll also be really good at the next thing, which is right. the distribution. Maybe you can get there. It's not like you can't get it. It's not like you can't learn that, but, but where do you want to double down? Do you want to double down on your next product or on, on driving more traffic or... Uh, do you want to spend it on, we've just bought a warehouse and now we hired some guys and we're trying to get a warehouse management system. And um, hopefully everybody that we hire is good. We don't know because we've never hired any of those people before. Yeah, it, it's a whole different ecosystem. And you know, I think of Helia, CEO of Slick Chicks, she's grown her business exponentially. And, and I like to believe that's in part because she doesn't have to worry about about distribution. She just needs to go out there and get her brand known, get into into the retailers and, and 
continue to network and build her enterprise and and we'll take care of the rest yeah and i i know uh just based on who you talked about as your customers you guys are specialists in certain things and i will say uh what i don't know nutraceuticals pharmaceutical uh, that that beauty products and now let me ask a question do you also ship to warehousing or to uh retail locations we do, we do. So, so we're 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 at omnichannel. So we do B two B, B two C. You know, I didn't speak about Amware, but you know, Amware has a huge depth of experience and proficiency in nutraceuticals, as you said. So we do a lot of vitamins and vitamin packs and kitting, as well as uh, medical devices uh, such as knee braces and and apparel. So uh, companies like Thirty Two Degrees and a, a huge depth of, of knowledge in in that respect. So that that's our core competency, and and we'll leverage we'll leverage up and, and stretch. Now, before we hit record, I, I spoke about a Dutch company called Van Moof, V A N M O O F. They're a Dutch company that is selling e bikes, and they are incredibly popular in Europe. And as in yeah, my, one one of my daughters bought one of those bikes. Yeah, it's a it's like the Tesla of e bikes. It's a great bike, and you know, they have a really good position on the West Coast. So, so when we met in, in the UK, because it, this is they're going to be distributing in the UK with Stasi and here in the US, it's just like, okay, how do we build? How do we build a distribution system for e-bikes? And and I said this before at the top of the uh, top of the call before we record, three PLs are are largely you know we pick it up, put it down, put it in a box, ship it out. What makes Stasi unique and what makes Amware unique now is is that we our USP is that we create bespoke solutions for our clients. So in many 3PLs will be like, oh, this is how we do it. This is how, you got to fit into our mold. Whereas you guys are creating us, custom you know, customized solutions, right? So and and <laughs> uh, from an operation standpoint, it's a nightmare <laughs> because you want one process and one system, but but for a client, I get it. Like, you know, their clients are unique. Their their requirements are unique, and we have to build a unique environment for them, for them to be successful, and for their customers to be happy. And and that's where we thrive. And that's why Van Moof is is partnering with Stasi in in doing their e-bikes, even though they know that's not they're going to be the first ones that that are in our our product portfolio of that size. Their boxes are, are pretty big. But they know that we're going to do it well uh, because we are creating that 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 end-to-end -end solution for them that is bespoke and just for them and it will create that value stream that that they're looking for yep yep absolutely i just said this on another podcast but the first time i was in a warehouse guy said are you familiar with what we do here i was like more or less and he goes simple <laughs> We get big boxes of stuff and we take stuff out of the big box and we put them in little boxes and then we ship those little boxes out because it's 90 percent of what we're doing here i was like looks a little more complex than that <laughs> but uh, that's that's what that's watering it down by a lot <laughs> yeah but getting back to what you guys specialize in i when you mentioned the nutraceuticals or women's beauty products, one of the things that occurred to me is, and, and you mentioned one of your retailers or one of your customers is selling uh, to disabled people. We have we have gone from, in a generation, from a mass market to just a million niche markets here. And when you talk about like food, if you were to ask your grandparents, what's a vegan or what's a vegetarian, they'd be like, what? Or what is keto? Or what is what is bodybuilding? There's So people are buying very specialized food. And then the same applies to makeup. It used to be, oh, I get makeup is makeup, moisturizer is moisturizer. Now there's, you know, the for oily skin, for dry skin, for um, <laughs> a million different applications. And the challenge is, Retailers don't always want to carry 60 types of bread for the vegans and the vegetarians and the keto people. So, and same with, you know, uh, retailers who sell beauty products. You can't possibly keep it on your shelves these days because it's so niche. I mean, that's the problem. I love Costco, but Costco more or less says there is no such thing as a niche. You're going to come, you're going to buy one thing, which I love. I love them. 
but that's a very specific thing. If you need something that they don't carry, there's a very good chance you're buying it online, right? Right. Yeah, and, you know, uh, Simon Sinek uh, said it best in, in his start with why. You know, the, the goal isn't to sell to everyone. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. And, and you know, Slick Chicks is a perfect example of that. Biology has a has a product where uh, it's actually a, a machine, but it's used by a professional who determines anesthetist that will tell you what, what kind of skin you have and, and you know, oily and density and so on and so forth. And then they have a product for for your specific type of skin. And, and Lime Life is doing the same thing with their makeup applicator uh, based on your skin and, and how much to apply and where to apply. So you know, the, these, niche, these niche products exist for a reason and, and we're proud to, to carry them because to your point, retailers, can't carry them, and, and in many cases, they don't want to carry them because they're trying to sell to a broad swath of people, and and we're trying to sell to people who believe what we believe. My friends over at Throughput, they, they do the math on all this stuff, and they said 30% of the things we make never see an end customer. It gets put on a shelf and maybe thrown away at some point. Now, we know there's there's waste in food, and that... That's perishable. Well, there's lots of things that are perishable, but then there's also stuff that is perishable, like the Christmas stuff that is not that worth not worth much on December 26th, and the Halloween stuff's not worth much the day after Halloween. We're what I always think about is retailers. I think not all of them will do this, but I think we're going to see retailers get smaller in their space and offer less options. And so yeah, it's going to be more of a curated experience. And by the way, Target is a tur- curated experience. I like going to Target's grocery store. It's small. You don't have all the options, but it's also small. And it's uh, I, I, and if I like what they curate, what do I care? And I think we're going to make the retail experiences are going to be more and more of an experience because none of us complain about going to a farm market or some cool boutique with really good food, right? That you go, oh my God, that is the best deli on earth They or prepared food. That we want to go to. The grocery store, eh, not really. It's just a, it's a it's must have. It reminds me when Amazon said, we are going to change the world. Now you can buy books online. You don't have to go to the bookstore. And I was like, dudes, I want to go to the bookstore. Take away the garbage can buying experience. I don't want to go buy garbage cans, right? And obviously, they became much more than a bookseller. But I think what we're going to see is the market's going to split where they we're going to have experiences when we get out of the house. And we do have to leave the house. We've noticed that now uh, since COVID. We want to leave the house. But if I would leave the house, it'd be cool to go for an experience. And the stuff that I can't get in that smaller footprint store, maybe I want to get it online and uh so that's why I think you're in a great niche because the keto people need something different than the vegans. <laughs> and uh, and who knows how many other new diets will pop up. I, I have a, a, a family member. Well, he's not a family member, not blood relative. He just died at 107 years old. And I was asking it. It's my oh, cousin's wow. grandpa. And I said, so what diet was he on? I'm assuming he was a vegetarian or something. <laughs> he laughed. He goes, yeah, he ate bologna sandwiches and potato chips, <laughs> box lunch. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, he, whatever he did, he made it, he made it work. So um, anyway, let's wrap this bad boy up. So we talked about, I want to summarize that I want to get some final thoughts. And I know there's a lot more things we could talk about on this. Well, I also, I want to give you your third uh, reason of, of why 3PLs will, will help. And, and I think of, because I've worked with private labels, private brands that, that distribute their own products. And I think what's missing is, is founders, particularly startup founders or companies that distribute on their own. Well, one, they don't have the expertise. But with that, they also don't have the, the technology. Uh. So 3PL providers and Saucy. We specialize in logistics and we have the expertise and the experience to optimize the supply chain. And you know, this, this obviously re- uh, results in improved efficiency and reduced operational costs, but it's the technology as well. And this is why we work with Rabat and, and other uh, technology drivers, because you know, we provide, uh, as a provider, we often have access to the latest technology uh, 
such as transportation management systems and uh, OMS and, and W warehouse management systems, which can improve visibility and tracking capabilities that's just not native to uh, a, a core business function. I got four now, so we so I'll, I'll summarize and then we got a bonus <laughs> got, one. So we talked okay. about, and I'm sure you could probably add 10 more to this list, but I'm going to summarize. I want your final thoughts on this. So three, now four reasons to outsource your fulfillment. And number one is economics. You're probably going to save some money. You're, you're going to turn a fixed cost into a variable cost in many situations. Second is it's not your core competency. It is the core competency of guys like Stasi. Number three, we talked about scalability. So if you all of a sudden want to get into a new market, if you need a new location, if you just need more capability to uh, more extra people so you can do more sales, you want to have a 3PL on board. And last but not least, we talked about the tech technology, which you don't know what tech to go buy. You need tech and you need expertise, and I'll call that operational expertise. By the way, I will say this. I've said it before. I get phone calls from companies, freight brokerages, um, trucking companies, uh, warehouses. There's a lot of warehousing companies that still don't have technology. And they're using, and and so so when you think to yourself is well I, I I I'm I live in a bubble I live in a bubble where I talk to people like yourself who are tech forward who are work for great operations that I'll say cutting edge and then my assumption becomes that that's the whole world but then I talk to other people especially smaller companies and I think if you're a small company and you say hey, I went to the local warehouse and this is what they said they can do. You need to open your eyes to a bigger world. <laughs> and and if you haven't been in the market right. in a while, I've experienced this where a company, very large company, had a 3PL that they had outgrown a million years ago. They were 80% of that company's business, but that company didn't have the operational expertise, didn't have the footprint, didn't have anywhere near the capability they needed, and they had to get rid of them. And I think there's a lot of people, you grow quick, and then all of a sudden you look at all your partners and say, can you continue to grow with me? And sometimes the answer is no. Yeah. Well, it's like I said, supply chain changes at a blinding pace, and you have to stay ahead of it. And, you know, technology isn't the, the panacea of solutions. You know, people first, for sure. But there are some... There are some some accelerators, some quality uh, some quality accelerators and process accelerators. Which, if you're going to be, if you're going to be in this business, you have to have. Whether it's sortation systems or or packing quality systems like Rabbit or scanning solutions for for RFID for picking and, and packing, those are just the basics. You have to you have to future proof your supply chain changing environment if you're going to be a, a formidable oh, yeah. and, contender. You, know, you mentioned Tusk. So say Tusk can come in and save you money, right? If I'm a small guy, I don't get exposed to that opportunity. If I'm, you're using Rabat, if I'm a small guy, I don't get exposed to that opportunity. And that's some of the challenges that you have. If you've decided, oh, I'm going to go it alone or go with a smaller player, Sometimes you're not getting exposure to the latest and greatest best practices, but also the latest and greatest tech. The bigger companies like yours are always experimenting with how can we get better? How do we make? How do we get faster, better, cheaper? Well, it's because we're invested in in finding it out. That's why, uh, but as you know, Manifest is is not cheap to get to, but it's worth it. Tickets aren't necessarily cheap either, but we make that an investment in. And seeing, okay, what is out there? Because the best, the best answers are not only are not always in our own experience. The best answers are out in the environment, and smarter people know what to do. We just got to go find them and have them tell us what to do. Right. So, I want your final thoughts on this. We talked about four reasons to outsource fulfillment. So, talked about economics, core competency, scalability. These are things you always get with it. And then the tech slash expertise, which might be part of core competency. But final thoughts on that. So, again, outsourcing distribution, uh, depending on your size, if you're relatively small, doesn't always make sense. But it can make sense if you are trying to grow your business exponentially. Again, you are... Distribution is is complex for a reason between 
dealing with carriers and then transportation and in-source uh, bringing uh, your products in from wherever they come from. That takes away from relationship building with your clients, relationship building with your vendors, marketing your product, growing your business. And then there's also the finance side, which if you don't have a finance person, you have to take care of. Founders, CEOs, uh, corporate uh, dev people, you already have enough hats that you have to wear. What you need is a partner that's committed to your success, to your customer success, and that can grow with you because that's it. I think the best adage I could use is someone told me, find a doctor close to my age so that way you grow old together. And, and that's what you want. You want. You want a company that's not too big, but that respects your size and and can grow with you and can and can expand and, and bend their infrastructure to support your growth. Although so we, we will take on a big a big customer. It sounds like you but, got some. <laughs> uh, maybe yeah, we, we do we do have some some very marquee customers that we're super proud of. Coca Cola in 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 the UK and and Hennessy and uh, so we have them, but we also we understand that. Small, mid-sized, biz- mid-sized businesses need somebody that understands them. Excellent, excellent. So what I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile. i also put a link to your website and any other links you give me so people can reach out and see you guys. What do you guys specialize in? What's your sweet spot? So again, this is where, where I said at the top of the call, we... 3PL logistics are more than just taking a big box, breaking it down, and putting the stuff into a little box. Where we shine, and, and and this isn't just hyperbole or me just saying this, this is where our clients say, we're the only company that will, will bend the universe in order to make their product fit us. It's not for them and to fit our processes. It's it's for us to, to create an infrastructure that will support them, their clients, and what they're trying to do and future-proof their distribution supply chain. So that 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 is our USP. That's what makes us special is, is our ability to create bespoke end-to-end supply chain solutions that, is, that will bring joy to, to not only upstream to our clients, but probably more importantly, downstream to, to their customers, which ergo is our customers. Excellent, excellent. So I like to interview smart, interesting people like you, Nathan. Who else should I interview on my podcast? Again, you're you're, you're keeping me to just one person. I know so many fantastic individuals that. Well, I interview I interviewed Ben. We already talked about Ben, and I already interviewed Shauna. So <laughs> the, the person that comes to mind, I just met him, is uh, Doctor Sankalp Oh, a doctor. He is the chief robotics. Uh, engineer and CEO of a of a new company called Gather AI, and what what Gather AI is doing is creating drones that use machine learning to to read their warehouse, right? So so by now drones drones are still new to 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 the warehouse environment, but there's still a long evolutionary path that that they have to take in order to be commonplace. And I believe that Suncop is kind of ahead of that in terms of, of barcode reading and optical character reading. And just if anyone is eminently qualified to build a smart drone, it's it's Suncop. He is he's one of the people on the team that helped build the Navy's first autonomous yep. helicopter. That's a good job. <laughs> so and he's such a he's such an intelligent individual, but just also just such a generous and sweet man that I promise you, you're going to enjoy your I'm, conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Now, I've, I'm uh, I'm all for drones if they if they if they can add the value that we hope. I still say this though, um, you're in Jersey City, nice skyline there. Can you imagine right now if you looked out the window and there's a whole bunch of drones flying by? I, I don't see us ever getting to that. Now, you're probably high up in a building, so I don't see that happening. I, I don't either because the FAA would have to make a lot of changes in their rulings for what can fly over populated areas and, and, and have to change their airspace. Uh-huh. Because you got you have to assume a drone can and will, will fall out of the sky. 
And where it lands is the responsibility of the operator. Well, I can guarantee they'll fall out of the sky out here in Michigan. If you're not killed by the the, the inner city people, you're going to be killed by the uh, the hunters out in, <laughs> hunters out in the suburbs. <laughs> somebody's going to somebody's going to turn it into a attraction. You say I got three ducks. So, I got three ducks and two drones. <laughs> yeah. So I, maybe that might work out in a rural area where you know Class G airspace where where anything goes, but. Here in in the New York metro area where we have Newark, LaGuardia, and JFK all in in the same airspace, and and we are technically in that airspace, I don't see how even flying – you can't fly 500 feet because you have the buildings – you fly at a thousand. Now you start getting into into different airspace. So figure this out. But there's a lot to lot that has to be. Um... Yeah. Again, people smarter than me in that air in that in that field are trying to figure. But it in out. a warehouse, I fully get it, and I I think that makes so much more sense. And I've also said we assume drones have to fly, but uh, maybe they're wheeled drones too. Um, I think I think we're going to see a lot lot of uh, interesting things because we do have a problem. No one wants, not everybody wants to work in a warehouse. And so we're going to have to figure out how do we find some machines that'll help us out in that area. And we've been talking about automating warehouses for a generation, and now we're finally starting to do it in uh, the, the the economics work. But I would love to interview him. You have to spell his name for me <laughs> after we after we get off the call. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, what conferences will I see you at? I mean, we're looking at Manifest. Back Expo. Certainly, Manifest. Uh, That's in March. They've Next already season. sent out the invite. There's, there's the annual. Uh, I believe it's the yes, the Certified Supply Chain Professional Conference that they have this, every year. You know, truthfully, I'd been out of the industry, uh, out of the industry conference visiting game for a while. So this is the first one that I'd been back in, in some time. And, and I missed it so much because I, I got to meet some fantastic people and, and learn a lot. And in my role, I guess I, I have to stay ahead of innovation and yes, technology. Exactly. And looking forward to, to going to new conferences and hopefully seeing you there. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, what I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, link to your website, and a link to anything else your marketing people give us. Yeah, congratulations on that new acquisition. And again, you guys are you are always a big player, but uh, now it's uh, now it's in the well, US. Now we're a big player in the United States and, and soon to be Stasi Americas. Yeah, do you guys also do cross border into Canada and Mexico? So we we obviously ship in, into 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 Canada and vice versa. We have a, a client, a Lucas Mayer Cosmetics, that's headquartered in Canada. So uh, we have that relationship there. But a lot of our clients are asking for foothold in Canada. You'll be in Toronto land soon. <laughs> we will be. We'll be. And South America is a – South America and Central America is a, a huge growing market. So we're in Laredo right now, uh, in, in Texas now. So we just got to creep down a little bit further past the past the border. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you taking the time, Nathan. Again, I, I love what you guys are doing. And that was really nice to meet you first at Manifest and then through the interview. Joe, it was lovely meeting you. Thank you so much for having me. You are most welcome. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.